This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. In Chapter 8, we briefly revise financing businesses or managing for value. We want to maximise for our shareholders the long-term cash-generating capability of organisations uh, and at the same time uh, get the appropriate amount of risk uh, attaching to these methods of finance. This chapter will look at what type of capital to raise, broadly equity of share capital uh, or loans, uh, and then how to invest that capital. The next chapter will look primarily at controlling the use of finance, which is really budgetary control. Essentially, this is F9 uh, revision for this chapter. So, uh, looking at uh, the... Uh, going forward here. Yep, types of capital. So the main uh, source of capital uh, for a business is equity uh, or you can have loan capital or borrowings. So equity capital is raised initially from the first owners uh, and then uh, from retention of earnings. Then if you need more capital, you can issue more shares and perhaps even go for a public offering and issue to the public. So an IPO is an initial public uh, offering and then subsequently, it would be normal to uh, raise more share capital through rights issues, something like a one for five rights issue, uh, where you give preemptive rights to existing shareholders. Great thing about equity, of course, uh, is that you don't have to pay dividends. Uh, it is the risk capital of the company. If the company does particularly well, then the value of the equity will rise. Uh, on the downside, if the company doesn't do so well, then it is the equity shareholders who are at the bottom of the queue really for payout of anything that's going to be left. So equity shareholders is kind of high risk, high return. Borrowings from banks or institutions or indeed individuals are much safer. Uh, really, people have to pay the interest or else the whole company comes tumbling down. And very often the borrowings are secured. So you can have term loans or debentures. A term loan is like a five-year loan, a three-year loan, a ten-year loan. A debenture is in a way just another name for, for, for that. You can have overdrafts, uh, which uh, can be repaid as fast as you like. But of course, the, the bank can demand repayable, that they're repaid immediately. So they're a little bit perhaps less risky, more, more risky. Uh, you can lease assets, which is essentially a form of borrowing. The lessor buys the asset and then you pay so much per month to use the asset. There are convertibles, interesting uh, item. They start off life as a debenture. Uh, so uh, you have got the uh, low risk of uh, always really looking forward to interest coming in. Uh, probably these uh, are also secured and assets of the company. But then maybe three, five years later, you have an option to convert the debentures into equity shares. And this gives you a great kind of wait and see possibility. I will get into the new company with my uh, convertibles in their kind of debenture form, low risk form, but it gives me an opening uh, into the higher risk form of capital with higher return if I say, see that this company is doing well. If it's not doing so well, I'll refuse the option to convert. I will stick with my safer, less exciting uh, debentures. And then you have preference shares, usually treated as a more of a form of borrowing. Uh, you, you More or less the preference dividends are going to be paid, but there's no real possibility of gain or loss in your preference shares. Anyway, for simplification, we, we tend to divide the argument into equity capital, risk capital, and some form of loans. So here, as I've said, loans and debentures are going to be cheaper than uh, equity. First of all, they are less risky. Almost certainly the interest is going to be paid. If the company goes into liquidation, uh, then the equity, then the, 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 the loans and debenture holders 
uh, are uh, coming really quite close to the beginning of the the queue for payout, and particularly if they have a, a charge, a mortgage and property, particularly a fixed charge, then if interest isn't paid or the, the loan is defaulted on in some other way, the lender can grab that property and sell it to recover their funds. So it's much less risky than equity. Uh, and also the interest payments enjoy tax relief. Uh, this makes debt a uniquely cheap form of finance. It is substantially subsidised by governments. Therefore, some borrowing is good. You want to make use of this cheap capital. Uh, uh, but too much borrowing is bad uh, because, of course, as you borrow more and more and more and the interest bill goes up and up and up and up, you are increasing the risk that uh, you will not be able to pay the interest bill and then receivers will be called in and the whole company is going to collapse. And you may remember, this is maybe going just a little bit further than we really need for, for P3, but uh, you, if you may remember these kind of diagrams here where you had debt equity ratios here and it's some form of percentage going uh, here. And you could show the, the debt kind of going like this. This is the cost of debt, KD, let's say. And you do cost of equity going there. And what was uh, particularly important was the weighted average cost of capital. The, the, the average cost of servicing the debt and the equity. Uh, it would start up here, just equity. You mix in a bit of the cheap debt. You are pulling down the cost of the uh, capital to the company. But then at very high levels of borrowing, there are no more assets to have security on. This is going to begin to go up. At very high levels of borrowing, your equity shareholders get more and more worried about investing in this highly geared company that's having difficulty paying its interest and so on. And this will go up as well. And then your whack is going to go up. So conventional gearing theory suggested that there was an optimum whack somewhere uh, that would give you the the minimum overall cost of capital. I think all you really need to, to, to remember for this is yes, you know, we will believe that there is an optimum gearing ratio. You don't, I think, have to get into Modigliani and Miller, people who would refute this um, uh, picture of stuff. Uh, so some gearing, some borrowing is good. Too much borrowing is likely to be bad. When we raise our capital, where do we put that money? Uh, basically, you have got a choice of two places. You could keep it as cash, or basically you keep it as current assets, or you put it into non-current assets, into fixed assets as they were called, plant machinery, premises and so on. If you put nearly all of your money into non-current assets, uh, the danger you have there is, will I have enough cash in the bank to pay my wages and my rent and my interest and so on? If you keep very, very high levels of cash, there'll be no difficulty paying your rent, uh, your wages, interest and so on. But you've got a lot of cash just kind of sitting there in your bank account, not doing very much, not being very productively used. So a co the company has to decide how much of its capital to put into working capital, to keep in working capital, and how much to put into non-current assets. Uh, there's no right answer, it depends on the company. Uh, if you are a company which is renting out properties, uh, then you know the, the rents come in pretty much like clockwork, very predictable cash flow forecasts. You can uh, live with less working capital. If, however, you are in a company which is maybe in manufacturing, you're living from contract to contract, the income goes up and down, your cash balances go up and down quite wildly, depending on when contracts come to fruition, then you would need to keep a, a, a bigger buffer, if you like, of cash and working capital for the maybe a few lean months where you don't get many sales. So we have to decide on the right balance between putting money into working capital and putting money into non-current assets. We also have to think of what sort of money we would want to use for what sort of investment in different sorts of assets. And broadly speaking, it's like real life. 
Uh, broadly speaking, what you do is you take out a form of borrowing whose term is approximately equal to the life of the asset you're investing in. So if you were buying a house or an apartment, the typical way to finance that is by having a 25 or 30 year mortgage. Because this is a long life asset, it's going to last for 25 or 35 years, uh, and, and that's how you match it. If you're buying a car on credit, then, then typically credit deals are going to be three or five years, uh, uh, which again roughly matches the life of the vehicle or certainly the time you're likely to be keeping it. So there are some sort of term loan for equipment uh, would would be suitable for buying machinery for the factory, but for the factory itself, long-term finance is what you want, equity or debentures. And then you have inventories, receivables, you have got fluctuations through the year uh, in these very short-term fluctuations, uh, and there you're probably going to use a short-term source of finance. Uh, so it's just like saying, well, I need to pay for my holidays now. Uh, that's the sort of thing you pay in your credit card. So you pay for your holidays now and your credit card, you have to repay it in a month or a number of months uh, if you don't pay it all off at once. But, but there's a certain logic in matching the term of the finance uh, to the life of the asset. And that's, that's what you would normally advise people to do. And finally, I'll briefly mention, remind you of the problem of overtrading. This is a, a problem which uh, often hits very successful businesses in the early days. Uh, the business is expanding rapidly uh, and if it's expanding rapidly it probably needs more inventory, it has to finance essentially more receivables. Uh, and it, it's also maybe putting a lot of money into non-current assets to keep production up with demand and so on. And it can suddenly discover that it hasn't got enough capital. Uh, people tend to budget for capital which is needed uh, for non-current assets, what they forget about is capital is also needed to fund inventories and also to fund the, the increased receivables until they actually pay up. And you're living really from hand to mouth, really trying to survive without enough capital. And the only real solution for this is to go out and actually raise more permanent capital, put more cash almost permanently into the non-current assets, into the cash balance, uh, so that you have this buffer which is there uh, to allow you to fund these non-current assets as you're expanding rapidly.